My job is done. He knows it. He knows all the answers. And he knows all the questions. Right? Here we go. We'll sit down. Right? So first of all, welcome to the UK. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Um, well, obviously, Voyager. We'll start off by Voyager. Can we have a round of applause? Am I right in saying over 170 episodes? Um, yeah, I think it might even be more than that. I haven't actually counted. It felt like more than 170. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a whole bunch of it for seven years. And a deliberate seven year arc as well. For all the shows except for Enterprise, they basically planned seven years because it, you know, they want to tell the story in a long sort of, uh, with a long sort of outline or layout. They don't want it to just meander after a while, so they had a solid plan for it, which I think is good. It makes it stronger. Now, obviously, you made, you played the character of Tuvok. Now, you also appeared in Generations. As one of the crew, what was that like compared to a TV series? Well, it's a, it's a it was a feature film, um, which takes a, they, they shoot a lot longer time period. So, like uh, the number of pages we shoot per day on a feature might be two or three, maybe four pages. Whereas on a series, you shoot on average seven to nine pages a day, and uh, and it was it was very cool. There's also more money in the budget during a, a shooting a feature film like that than there is shooting just a daily or weekly episodic. So it was pretty cool at the time. It was it was fun. I got to work with William Shatner and uh, James Dillon, uh, obviously um, uh, Walter Koenig, and uh, and I enjoyed it. It was great. It was a it was a very cool week that week. And I didn't at the time, you know, Voyager hadn't really been planned. They were talking about it and thinking about it, but they hadn't really laid it out yet. So. It was, it was before Voyager took place. Didn't see all that coming. So, how did you get the part as Tuva? Uh, what I mean is, is, you go for an audition, and how long did the audition take until you actually found out that you got the part? I went in... I think I went in twice. I read for... I read for the producer, Rick Berman, and then I read for the, I think, one of the network people at the time. It was a brand new network. It was called the UPN, United, uh, well, I call it the U Pretend Network. But that's, it was, uh, UPN was the network that we launched Voyager on. It was part of Paramount at the time. And I went in twice, I think, on that, like a Friday to read for it. Um, and then I think I went in on that Saturday to read again. And that was it. Yeah, that was it. Um, Rick Berman, the producer, had already, you know, wanted me to come in and read for it in the first place. He already had it in mind to cast me in that role because I already worked on three of the Trek shows by that time. So, and they tend to use people over and over. So he already had me in mind, and the part was written for me. I was right for it. You know, if I had been, you know, five foot two and you know, two hundred seventy-five pounds, I wouldn't have gotten the role. If I had a dialect or an accent, I wouldn't have gotten it more than likely. So it just worked out timing-wise uh, that I got that. I was in line. I was actually waiting to do a, uh, another role in a film at the time, and they were waiting for me to say yes or no because I had been offered that role. And I said, you know, I don't want to take that until I'm sure that this other one is not, you know, is going to happen or not going to happen, which was Voyager, because I knew Voyager was going to be on for, you know, at least seven years. So, you know, from a business standpoint, it made sense for me to hold off as long as I could on the other part if to make sure this was going to come through or not. You know, don't want to take a risk of losing, <laughs> losing out. I could have easily been on, you know, Baywatch instead of Voyager. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a matter of, you know... It doesn't matter what you have an appointment for, it could have, and what you could have landed, you know, and I could have been running around the beach with Hasselhoff and stuff. <laughs> um, but anyway, that's, you know, uh, that's basically how that came about, yeah? So, out of the seven years that you actually filmed this, 
who did you get to become friends more with? Or because obviously it was like a family. Yeah. So who out of all the cast did you get on with the best with? Well, um, I would say it wasn't it wasn't Ethan Phillips. <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I like Ethan, he's okay, he's cool It's just that, you know, if I ever need a brain transplant, I want his. Because I know he's never used it. He's, not that, he's actually a really nice guy. I do like him. I like Ethan. But then again, I like falling out of trees, too. So. It's all right. It's, it's okay. I mean, he thought Sherlock Holmes was a housing development, but that's all right. That's all right. Um, he's a, he's a, he was actually the most fun, you know, to work with because he's a prankster. He's like the like full time. The guy's got more jokes. He's like an encyclopedia with the jokes every single day. We had new jokes if I was working with him. Um, he wasn't working heavy, heavy schedules because his makeup is so intense and like hours and hours to get it on, and then you got another hour to get it off, and it's brutal, you know, physically to do that kind of gig. So his, his storylines would only come up once in a while. And we had several together, which I really enjoyed. Uh, he's a lot of fun to work with. You know, uh, Bob Picardo is always a kick in the pants because he's also very quick-witted, very funny. Uh, and we would joke around a lot on the set. The best thing about working on Voyager was really the, the people that I worked with. It was not, it's not the hours, man. It's not the, <laughs> the shooting, forget it. That's like the most tedious, monotonous, boring thing you've ever seen. Because people, you know, would come to the set and they'd visit all the time, the friends of the producers, or friends of the actors, or friends of the crew, or whatever. They'd show up on the set, and oh my god, they're jumping around, they're all giddy and ready, and so happy, and excited, and I could set my watch by the time they're gonna realize how boring, and slow, and tedious it is. Two hours later, they're going like, well, why do they keep saying the same line over again? Yeah, that's what it is. It's long 16-hour days, on average, very early calls. Dialogue changes that come at you at uh, 11 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night. They send you script line changes. You gotta try to memorize them while you're sitting in the makeup chair. They are word for word, you cannot paraphrase. And, uh, and you're exhausted. You're exhausted working on those things. Very slow, very slow process. Okay, last time I looked around, that ain't so much fun. Uh, the people I worked with, Fabulous. A lot of good the crew. It was hysterical. The makeup people, we just joke and goof off all the time with the cast as much as we could get away with goofing off and, and having a laugh. We would do it. But the actual work, man, it's cramming lines, cramming dialogue. And as, you've, as you're well aware, that's not common dialogue either. So, you know, there's a lot of work. So the best thing about it was that, and, and I got along with the, everybody on there, but Ethan is one of my favorites, because he would really, you know, he would try to get me to crack all the time, because that was his life's mission. And then Bob Picardo was just a very funny guy, very witty. So we're, so we're just goofing off about the stuff we're doing. These guys were great. I, I, and I see them every once in a while, so it's nice too. Yeah. It must be really hard when you've been a Vulcan who doesn't smile. And you've got somebody trying to make you smile. <laughs> Have we got any questions from the audience? We've got to ask some questions. Can I ask a question, please? What was your favourite episode that you filmed? Uh, the episode is probably uh, uh, Future's End, one and two. Uh, was the, was the, my favourite because it was the most fun. Uh, I got to work with Sarah Silverman uh, for that week or so, and uh, we shot both episodes outside the studio running around the city of Los Angeles beautiful weather not unlike this weather gorgeous spring I was in my civilian clothes because we went back in time to earth and uh, we were off the sound stages so it was it was a lot more fun to work on that show that week otherwise it's very much the same thing every single week it's very tedious uh, working on the same sound stage same set same everything so it was nice to get away that, that turns out to be one of my favorite uh, episodes. Any more questions? Yeah. They're always at the back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> always. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Hello. Um, Van Vlundy Films. Do you think um, Axe and R's had any impact on the fans giving them all for Van Vlundy Films? Yeah, I, well, it, uh, uh, it, it was a phenomenon once it started, and it was very successful uh, for myself uh, and the producers of Renegades and some other projects because they were based on you know the franchises that people recognized and they wanted to see more of it, and there was nothing being done. I mean, there was no new series. There, the, you know, the films weren't really being done that much except for uh, JJ's and people wanted to see some of the other stuff so there wasn't a, a lot of it on the market. And uh, Axanar, as it turns out, you know, they, they did raise a lot, a lot of money but they didn't really use it like it was supposed to be used. We did. Um, and the only reason that a lot of that shut down is because, number one, because they used a lot of money for, some, for other things other than actually making the show. And the other, and uh, the fact that the this, this CBS is finally doing a new series, so they're going to do a new series. They can't have competing projects online when they're doing their own show, and they own the copyright, and they're going to charge a subscription fee to see it. So they'd rather have you giving the money to them rather than giving it to everybody else. That's how that works. That's business, man. You know, we're, we're, it, we raise money based on their franchise in order to make the projects for people who still watch the show. And that's how it worked. Yeah, the evolution of that process, as it were. Another question? Yeah. What's your favorite flavor muffin? What's it now? Flavor flavor muffin. My favorite? <laughs> well, that's an unusual question. Uh, typically, blueberry is one of my favorites. Yeah. Yes. The, yeah, the kind with the nice crust on it. Yeah. Next question. Oh, is there somebody in front of you? We've got time for another question after this. When are we going to see a Renegades 2? Um, well, Requiem right now is going to be done by the by the 12th of this month. So the first part of, of Renegades 2, which is Requiem, the first part's already on, I think, streaming, and the second part's going to stream after the 12th, later on in this month in July. We're going to have a screening back home on the 12th, so shortly after that, he'll put it out. And that'll be the second part. I don't know if they're going to go any farther beyond that. It depends on how much money they can raise, because, you know, um, if he's able to sell, because Renegades now, if we do it further, it's going to be just Renegades. It can't be Star Trek Renegades. So if he raises money to do it, he can actually sell them, which makes it more, you know, a lot easier to actually make more of them. So if he could sell that as a series, he may be able to get a budget to be able to produce a series of those shows, which I think would be a kick. I, I love the, the premise and the concept. Yeah, I'd be involved, sure. I'd be, you know, shooting it and maybe, you know, in front of camera as well as one of the characters. So it looks great, though. Renegades, uh, the Requiem, second half of the Requiem uh, episode looks great. I mean, I've, I just got a, a link for it to, to check the uh, music composition score, and it sounds and looks great. It's, it's a lot of a lot of exciting stuff. Going on. So I'd love to open it up to you know some more episodes, but the, you know that's the producer's call. It's their job. I don't have anything to do with it. They call me when the days come to work. And that's when I show up. Yeah. Um, this is the last question. Yes. Yep. When you got the job of Star Trek, how did you prepare for your character? Uh, for Tuvok's character, um, I just looked at sort of an amalgam of the Vulcans that had been presented prior. So there were some from the original series, including uh, Nimoy's character, and then there were some other Vulcan characters that were portrayed in a couple of the movies. And so I kind of put, a, a, you know, a combination of their traits together for this character to start with. And then uh, the writers and myself on occasion developed his character and gave him the, the different levels and different, you know, fleshed him out. Because his character is full Vulcan, Spox was not. My character had gone through Ponfar, had a wife and kids, but Spox had not. So all of those different aspects and traits we played out during the series to give him his own sort of uh, identity. And uh, But to start with, we just wanted to make sure that, you know, 
if it's a Ferengi, they, you have a walk and a talk that's Ferengi. If it's Klingon, you got to walk and a talk that's Klingon. For the Vulcan, you've got to walk and a talk. You've got to come on the screen and appear to be that character before he even opens his mouth. And that had to be believable to the people who already know uh, the show. So I used all the traits uh, that I'd seen several of these Vulcan characters portrayed and sort of put that together into a, a combination just to, to make this character, to give him a start, starting point. And that was it. You know, I made him a little bit more severe, a little bit more uh, 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 Vulcan-like, as it were, than Spock generally, because he was a full Vulcan. So I tweaked him that much. Yep. There you go. Can we have a round of applause, please, for Mr. Tim Yeah, what an awesome guy. Yeah. Thank you so, so much. Uh, yeah. It's good to now be having some photos, so I don't know if anybody has got any photos with him booked. Yeah. Please go and get queuing now, because um, this is going to be busy for this.